Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer Fantasy lore. Considering recent releases, I think it is about time we took a trip up north again, to the lands of Kislev, to have a look at something a little bit more specific about those lands. I have already done a more generalistic video on Kislev, but now we're going to delve a bit deeper into one specific aspect of it the legal system, and today, specifically, we will be dealing with the more barbaric part of it, Ungol Law, because it's quite fascinating. Perhaps next month again we'll have a look at its twin in the slightly more civilized southern reaches, Gospodor Law, but for now, we're sticking with the horse-maddened barbarians. It may indeed even surprise you to learn that the Pony Pounders even have the concept of organized law, and well, it's no concept of law that we might recognize, but they do have at the very least something that resembles a judicial system. In much the same way that two ferrets drugged up on PCP fucking in a box resembles a romantic comedy, but hey, it's a start. I should probably also point out that no one actually technically entirely knows what Ungor Law is, because it's not actually written down anywhere, it hasn't been officially codified, and there is no works to which various judges can refer when passing down their sentences. Instead, Ungor Law is simply remembered by various members of Ungor society, generally speaking the wise men and medicine women of the various villages, and this of course in turn means that Ungor law is highly interpretive, or more correctly, it means that Ungor law is, on very rare occasions, not simply whatever the village elder thinks is correct at the time. Now you may very well think that this sounds like a legal system somewhat open to abuse, and you might be correct in that, although there are some qualifiers. Let's just put it like this, foreigners are very rarely given much of a fair trial in Kislev, and certainly not in the Ungol territories in general, but within Ungol society it usually suffices to maintain law and order, and at the very least some vague semblance of justice. So what are the key fundaments of Ungol law? Well. There are of course the more uh, basic things, don't steal somebody else's shit and do not beat them to death with a variety of blunt or edged objects, but there are also somewhat more specific laws, for example the law surrounding hospitality. After having been driven from their lands very, very long ago by the original Gospodor conquerors, the uncles now primarily inhabit the northern oblasts, the truly shitty parts of Kislev, where it is just as easy to freeze or starve to death as come across a less than entirely hospitable northern raiding warband and meet your demise at the pointy end of a screaming demon blade. And so when one takes into consideration all of the natural, unnatural, and human hazards that are oh so very common in the oblasts, it is not much of a surprise that it essentially became law that you are expected to provide hospitality to anyone that asks for it. Unless they're, you know, marauders or chaos knights, those are unsurprisingly exempt from this particular law. But you are expected to provide hospitality, including food, shelter, and drink to anyone that requests it, again, under the assumption that they are, you know, normal. And so refusing anyone hospitality is considered a very severe crime. Indeed, Many would even argue that it should be considered equally as bad as flat out murdering someone, because shutting your door to the starving or the exposed in the northern oblast, well, that is de facto a death sentence in most circumstances. And whilst of course there are certain provisions and exceptions, again this being a highly interpretive law, they are very very few and far between. For example, shutting your gates, the gates to a village, against a group of refugees that are literally 15 feet in front of a northern warband, 
there would probably be considered a relatively reasonable and prudent action, despite the fact that that absolutely would deny hospitality to the poor bastards, at least in the 15 seconds they've got left to live. But in any less extenuating circumstances, hospitality is an absolute requirement, even if two groups are almost equally destitute. Let's for example say that two groups of step nomads run into another in the middle of a godforsaken snowstorm. Who has the right of hospitality there? Well, by and large, it is the larger group that must offer hospitality to the smaller, though this could of course then later on become a legal matter for investigation to figure out which group was actually responsible for providing for the other in those circumstances. And of course, in extreme situations like this, offering hospitality to another band of people well, that might not actually be a particularly good idea. If you've got a group of 30 ungles already starving to death, and then you are literally obliged to take in another group of 20 ungles with no food whatsoever, you are required to offer whatever little resources you have first to the group that you are offering hospitality to. This may seem like a system quite open for exploitation, but the Ungles have a thought of this because, well, it is a rather obvious problem, is it not? Therefore, the only crime, besides murder, that is worse than refusing hospitality, is to abuse another's hospitality. Taking more than what is strictly required, or even worse, stealing from the host or murdering them? in extremes, is the worst thing an Ungol can possibly do. And Ungol society will go to great lengths to ensure that anyone in violation of this law are hunted down and brutalised. It is not at all much of a rarity for these uh, prosecutions to carry on for literally years as the guilty party is brought to justice. And speaking of the guilty party, this is where we find another fascinating little deviation from more civilised law. Namely, the fact that in Ungol society, a crime is not a personal individual matter, it is a community responsibility. This means that the guilty party, the guilty individual, is not necessarily the one to receive punishment. In some very severe cases, there could be multiple members of the guilty group who are judged for one action. In some cases, even entire parties could be judged guilty of a crime. This is the case in the example of a breach of hospitality. If a member of a group abuses another group's hospitality, then the entire group is convicted of that crime. In extremists, there are of course again levels there as well, but in the case of for example something like the murder of the host, then the entire group Regardless of whether or not they were in on it, whether they were complicit, or even whether or not they agreed with the crime being committed, all of them are found equally guilty and will be punished equally harshly. On the flip side, it also allows other members of the group to take upon themselves a punishment for another member of the group. Let's say, for example, that a young boy was caught stealing an apple because he was hungry. Right, okay. Well, the punishment for stealing that apple might be having your hand lopped off. That kinda sucks. Maybe then another member of the group, an old person for example that is no longer expected to carry out manual labour, will say, alright, you know what, I'm guilty of this. And the group is then the ones actually presenting the guilty party. So group A has been wronged and they go, hey group B, give us whoever is guilty of this. And group B can then at that point simply deliver over the one they think is guilty, the one they know is guilty, or, well, 
anyone they damn please from within that group. This could also allow, for example, a hale and healthy warrior individual of the group to take on himself a punishment of a lashing, for example, instead, again, of an old person who might actually die of the lashing. And the crazy doesn't end quite there either. With this idea of communal responsibility of crimes, you need to have the ability to actually identify a community. If an individual is not necessarily held responsible for their actions, and rather the group, you have to determine what group the individual belongs to. In the case of Ungol society, this is relatively simplistic, as it is divided into hierarchical family groups. For example, you might be punished as a part of a family. Now, a family can be far more than just a mother, a father, and children. It can be an extended family grouping as well. Indeed, some families might contain dozens upon dozens of individuals. Alternatively, a larger entity, a clan, may be punished instead, or it might be accused of a crime as an entity. On an even larger level, an entire tribe might be viewed as guilty. And in extreme scenarios, such as basically flat-out war crimes between the tribes, the largest grouping of all, the Stanitsas, might again be viewed as guilty. The Stanitsas is basically a confederation of the tribes, a small nation within the nation. But what then, you may ask, happens if a member of a clan commits a crime against another member of the clan or within one of these organizations? Well, then you essentially just take one step down. So if a member of the same Stanitsa commits a crime against anybody else, then it will be brought down to the clan level. And if it's within the clan, it'll be brought down to the family level. And if it is within the family level, then it is not a matter for the courts at all. <laughs> courts, quote-unquote. In that case, the head of the family is allowed to carry out any punishment that he so pleases. The head of the family has absolute power within his own household. Now, it should also be pointed out that it is not always a collective responsibility. Most crimes that are carried out with one person to another person, like the theft of a piece of property or a murder or something like that, will be settled between the two disputing parties on as low of a level as possible, maybe even just within the various families. In such a scenario, where a family has been found guilty, they will then be given a period of time in which to produce the guilty party, with it being preferred that they produce the actual guilty party, but that is not necessarily a hard law demanding that they produce whoever was actually guilty, as talked about previously. This time period is usually about a week or two, and it depends upon the size of the group being asked to deliver the guilty party. For example, if you're asking a Stanitsa to deliver a one person, and it might consist of a few thousand individuals living scattered over God Emperor only knows how many miles, they might have time limits all the way up to a several years, for example, to finally hunt down and deliver the person responsible. And finally, as the third part of this, when two groups are contesting a crime, whether or not it has happened, neither of those groups can actually judge the crime. That has to be left over to a third grouping as well. And this is where the Tsarina finally gets on the field. The Tsarina does not have a whole lot of control over Ungor law because one of her predecessors promised the Ungols that they would be able to govern themselves, including maintaining their own legal system. And the Tsarina has to respect this decree. Although she has herself also issued another decree stating that any Ungol household may petition to be accepted under Gospodor law rather than Ungol law. And of course, obviously, this petition cannot be reversed although it is only actually granted in occasions where it is wildly accepted that this would be a good thing. The Tsarina wants to tread very carefully amongst the Ungols because they are her shield against the northern marauders. She does not want to piss them off lest far more of those marauding warbands mysteriously slip through the net than usual. 
but she does have some control. The third party judge must be accepted by the Tsarina. Now, in most cases, several individuals will be brought up as possible judges, and then a list of names will be dispatched for her personal approval. This generates a <laughs> frightening quantity of paperwork for the Tsarina, but, well, you know, dig a hole for others and you might just end up falling into it yourself, Tsarina. Unfortunate, I know, but oh well, such is the burdens of centralized society. But you may have noticed we've been talking so far about Ungol on Ungol crimes. In the case of such a collectivist criminal system, what happens if a group outside of Ungol society commits a crime? Well, that's when it gets interesting. The way the Ungols view it is this. Anyone who is not an Ungol, anyone who does not belong to a family, a tribe, or a stanitsa, is therefore simply a separate group. For example, all Gospodors are the one and the same group. So if any Gospodor commits a crime against an Ungol, then any member of the Gospodor well, race slash nation is responsible for that crime, and the Ungols may carry out punishment upon any one of them if the correct criminal is not handed over within the time period allotted. This, of course, would lead to a great deal of problems if Ungols simply haul off random villages for punishments for crimes they haven't even heard of. <laughs> Never mind actually committed. This is why the Tsarina has actually created a specialized formation, the Stelnikis. These are Gospodor criminals hauled out from prisons and given a chance to enjoy the sweet, free air once again. And in return, their job is to hunt down Gospodor criminals and deliver them to the Ungols. And should they fail in hunting down the individual within the allotted time, then one of them, the Stelnikis, will take the punishment in the Gospodor's stead, therefore ensuring that the Ungols will not be carrying out more expedient forms of justice upon random Gospodor civilians. And finally, there is also one more group. Foreigners. <laughs> yes, indeed, all foreigners are simply considered to be one and the same entity, with absolutely no distinctions whatsoever. So a Tilean, should he wander so far north, may commit a crime against an uncle, and an empire merchant might find himself nailed to a wall in his stead. Ah, uh, it, it's probably a good thing that there aren't actually that many foreigners in Ungol lands when you come to think of it. Especially as the Ungols are just a little bit racist. Oh yes, indeed. Whilst they usually will give plentiful time limits to their own people, for the foreigners as a group, they usually give them a day or two if they're feeling generous, or a couple of hours if they're feeling particularly cuntish on that particular occasion. <laughs> and hey, if they're like, oh, well, you know, you're a large tribe, have a year to find your guilty person. And then they look at just foreigners as a general concept spanning 99.9% .9 of the world and go, 12 hours, bitch. <laughs> Unfair? Yes, but hey, if you've wandered that far north, um... Something's wrong with you, so you probably deserve it. And one finer little nail in the coffin as well. As mentioned in the case of Ungols vs Ungols, a third party clan, tribe or family or stanitsa will be brought in as a judge. So what happens then if you have an Ungol vs a Gospodor and neither group can bring in a judge? Well in those cases, a foreigner is often brought in. Frequently witch hunters from the Empire because, well, the Ungols look at those crazy motherfuckers and they go, yes, this man is a good person. He shoots people without any kind of compunction whatsoever. He could judge, yes. But in the case of laws within Kislev, however, now this is where it gets a little bit complicated. What happens if a foreigner 
is the problem. So then you are looking at the group, in this case it will be Kislev as a group, including Gospodors and Ungles, versus Foreigners as a group. In that particular scenario, there is no truly neutral party, because the Ungles have basically decided that the entire world at that point is divided into just two groups, Kislevits, Ungles and Gospodors under one, and Foreigners. There simply exists no third party, and the Ungles, uh, well, they approach this <laughs> quite clear problem with a great deal of subtlety and finesse and <laughs> like shit they do. They just simply say that any judge may serve, and as the judges, generally speaking, are Ungles, <laughs> yes. It uh, may come as little surprise that the conviction rate of foreign criminals in Ungol courts are remarkably high. But what is a legal system without punishment? We've talked a lot about how the punishment are actually handed down and the processes surrounding it, but we haven't gotten to the fun part yet. And with the Ongols, it is all the fun part. They do not have any concept of a fine, for example, or imprisonment as a punishment. The former is quite obvious in that the Ongols don't have all that much in the way of fixed settlements, and by and large the various tribes would not be able to maintain a captive over long periods of times, and even if they could, what the hell would be the point? It would just be another mouth to feed whilst they traipsed the course to the oblasts, wouldn't it? There would be very little in the way of tangible benefit for, well, anyone involved. Hell, even for the Ungol being punished, what really is this except free room and board for the next period of time? Now, imprisonment is not really a thing in Ungol society. As for the lack of fines, as mentioned there are no fines as in there are no monetary compensations being given via court order, however, compensations do exist. For example, if um, somebody stole a horse, they might be judged to give two horses back, for example, or something along those lines. But mostly, Ungo law prescribes more physical forms of punishment. The Ungols believe that the only way a thief is ever going to learn anything is if they really feel it. And as the saying goes, if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't count. But seeing as life on the steps is, uh... Harsh, even on a hale and healthy individual, these punishment are very, very rarely taken to the point of being well, lethal, in which case the harshness of life hardly matters much, or being crippling or severely debilitating. With these restrictions in mind, the most common form of punishment, therefore, is usually some form of a beating or flogging. A very nice and simple punishment would of course be to have the offended party simply beat the shit out of the dude who committed the crime for a set period of time and with the set severity as well, again to avoid any kind of long lasting injury. Or a more measured approach would be flogging with various instruments. Now being flogged is actually a rather wide term that can refer to anything from being lashed by a specialist instrument like a whip or a cat and nine tails, or simply being just smacked a bit with a piece of wood or some other material. And this is where the judges can be very precise in dealing out the punishment. For whilst Ungor law is not officially codified anywhere, the judges do take a great deal of pride in actually handing down an appropriate and just punishment. At least within the various Ungol tribes, remember this is also a system where blood feuds are hardly uncommon, and therefore if you are a judge in such a system, it might pay to be a little bit um, precise when you hand down the judgments. Let's say for example for a minor crime the individual may receive 12 strokes across the back with a wooden pole. Alright, it's gonna hurt. 
Well, it might even double you over, but it's not going to be any kind of permanent damage or scarring. A more severe crime might see you whipped with a cat o' nine tails. A wonderful little invention. It is a lengthy piece of corded leather with usually little knots tied at each of the nine tails. This means that since you have those little corded leather knots and you get that whip effect, that hurts pretty bad, and can absolutely draw some blood too. And if the judge is feeling a little bit sadistic on that particular evening, it might not just be knotted leather at the end of those tails. Some of the crueler variants even had tiny little sharpened metal pieces at the end of each one of the individual tails. Now that is going to cause some bleeding. But... Crucially, a flogging is not going to kill you, unless it's one of the more extreme variants. For example, the British had a peculiar tradition referred to as flogging round the fleet. This was uh, reserved for only the most vile and mutinous of offences within the British Navy, where the offender would be rowed around to various ships in a port so as to demonstrate to all of the crews what would happen to you if you broke certain um, high and holy rules and regulations. And to make a proper example at every ship, this was usually a... Lots of lashes, several hundreds of lashes, and at that point it's starting to get dangerous, not so much because of the lashes itself, but because you are covering a man's back in tiny little cuts. Now imagine doing that in Ungor lands in the northern oblasts where the closest form of medical aid you are likely to find is an old woman who swears up and down that covering your back in cat piss and tree bark is the shortest way to avoid infections. Oh yeah. At that point, flockings do start getting dangerous. Another favoured punishment, a little bit less extreme in one way and yet a hell of a lot more extreme in another, is branding. Now, being branded in and of itself is hardly a pleasant experience. Having a piece of glowing hot metal stapled to some part of your body is something that I personally would probably like to avoid, if at all possible, but it is the social consequences in this case that are the true consequences. There are, of course, various brands with various meanings. A thief might, for example, be branded in a certain way, and that will, of course, make merchantmen look twice at you before doing any business with you. Other brands could be for murder or for rape or for any of a wide variety of offences. Again, Ungor law being quite interpretive. In this case, the primary differential, because of course, you know, this is a pretty damn obvious punishment. If you're branded as a thief, well, there's not a whole lot of subtlety in that. You are branded as a thief forever and ever. But here the subtlety comes into play with the location of the brand and the size of the brand. For example, a particularly cuntish individual might receive one right on his forehead. A nice big one. That's going to be difficult to conceal, while someone guilty of a much lesser crime might receive it somewhere where it could be reasonably concealed, but still be expected, so that anyone who was particularly suspicious might ask you to, for example, show them your uh, upper arm, or something like that. There are also other forms of branding which are a little bit more severe. One, particularly one, actually a couple fascinating ones I seem to remember from the source book, the RP one I believe, was punishment by the glove and punishment by the helmet. In these cases, first and foremost, a metal glove would be heated up to the temperature where the steel was literally glowing, and then the criminal had his hand encased in that glove. <laughs> Ah. Oh. Now, this would be carried out for a relatively short period of time, again depending upon the severity of the crime, but this would be a very harsh punishment, since this might very well be fully debilitating. It might 
deprive you of the use of your hand for pretty much forever for any kind of dexterous or careful maneuvering. And in a land like the Ungols, where horsemanship is of such paramount importance, losing the use of a hand... Not nice. Not to mention as well, this would also function as a social stigma, um, unless you're wearing gloves, of course, in which case you could possibly hide it. And the second one was kind of the same thing, except in this case it was a helmet. So a helmet that you could divide into two, so a face mask and a back, heated up again till the metal glowed cherry red, and then closed around the offender's head. This is usually an execution, first and foremost, because that kind of heat that close to your face is gonna suck some major balls, and secondly, it was considered an even worse form of punishment, a disfiguration in extremis. Now, I do recall, however, that there was a piece of mercy there. Some judges who were feeling, you know, kind and generous on that particular occasion, despite judging someone to die by having their face burned off, might also order that a large nail be driven through the back of the helmet and into the offender's spine or head, thereby ending his life rather quickly. Though there are even mention of a few truly retardedly hardy individuals supposedly surviving punishment by the helm. Mmm, nasty. And of course, again, with Ungor law being as interpretive as it is, there is, technically speaking, an infinite variety of different punishments ranging in all manners of degrees of severity and permanency. Everything from just a quick slap, potentially, a slap across the wrist, a punch in the face, or all the way up to straight-up execution. Or, in some cases, where execution is deemed a little bit too harsh, yet at the same time, you don't want to let the bugger live, um, exile might be chosen, with a nice big fat brand to go with it. Now, being exiled and barred from hospitality due to the brand in the northern oblasts, well, that is basically a death sentence, but should the unlucky individual manage to make it further south, there is still the possibility that he might live. This is also a punishment oft favoured by some of the more religious judges because it is viewed as, at least in part, leaving the judgement into the hands of the gods. Mostly Urson in the case of Kisler, which might, for example, see a convicted person sent in to the den of a bear. And, well, you had to stay in there for six hours, buddy, if you get back out again. Clearly you weren't guilty, or at the very least, you didn't deserve the punishment. If you don't come out again, well, there you go. Guilty as charged, and the bear got some food out of it as well. Win-win. The sky really is the limit when it comes to Ungol law. And we will wrap it up there. I'm thinking next month we're gonna do one on Gospador law as well, because it too is rather vicious and rather brutal, and also somewhat mercurial, but uh, still a hint more civilized than the Ungol equivalent. Until next time, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. As usual, if you like the video, please do consider sharing it around, even though, uh, yeah, hardly a lot of art in this one, unless you count the animated background, I suppose. Strangely enough, there wasn't actually that much artwork uh, available for Ungol Court of Law. Huh. Strange that. Have a good day.